the fact that Ceausescu was invited not only to Buckingham Palace, but we have to bear in mind three times, three times uh, to state visits to the United States. Not one Romanian president since 1990 has been on a state visit to the United States. Ceausescu managed three of them. Uh, and that says a lot about the role which the United States saw Ceausescu playing as a breach in the wall of communism. He singled out Nixon, in particular saw Ceausescu as a good communist, as a good communist, and indeed Vice President Bush, I think it was in 1983, described Ceausescu as a good communist. Um, of course, to many in Romania, I thought, and I was there at the time, and visits thought this was rather ironic um, when Ceausescu was pursuing these policies of austerity and clamping down on any form of resistance to his regime. Hello everyone and welcome to this new episode of Practical Wisdom with me, Samuel Maruska. Today's focus is Communism, the Iron Curtain and Eastern Europe. And I'm delighted to be joined in this conversation about Communism by Professor Denis de Letant. Denis, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Hello. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you very much for coming. Mm. Denis de Letant is a historian and uh, he is an emeritus professor at UCL University College London School of Slavonic and East European Studies. He was a professor in Washington, D.C. Professor Deletant has written numerous books on the history of Romania, on communism and Eastern Europe. He published Ceausescu and the Securitate. He also published um, Communist Terror in Romania. He published an amazing book called British clandestine activities in Romania during the Second World War. He also published Romania under communist rule and um, also a very recent book is In Quest of Romania, which is uh, uh, something that I really, really loved reading. He also published a great book on the Holocaust in Romania called Hitler's Forgotten Ally, Ion Antonescu. I'd like to start this conversation by demystifying communism. Now, Communism means that we, all, we should all be equal, we're all equal before the law, and we should all have equal opportunities, and we should treat each other uh, with the same respect, and we, are, we, all, we all have the same dignity as human beings. Now, this seems to me as a very good thing, and uh, many, many people in our contemporary culture would say that equality is something to be uh, sought after, something uh, ideal. But the question is, do you think communism is a good idea that was implemented wrongly? I think um, it's, in theory, an admirable idea. The problem is, I think, that um, it was imposed mm. from the Soviet Union. So it was born, if you like, applied in the Soviet Union. And the practice of its application made the neighboring countries of the Soviet Union fearful of what would happen because the communist revolution uh, required the revolution of society. It required the destruction of a middle class, of people who have made uh, money. Um, yes, it was about bringing levelling up, if you like. But in doing the levelling up, repression was required. And so I think it's important when we're looking at communism in Europe, in Eastern Europe in particular, to remember that no one in Eastern Europe voted for communism. Yes, they may have uh, voted for it in inverted commas, or at least the historical movement momentum led to the imposition of communism in Russia, but no one was voted into power as a communist in Eastern Europe. And therefore, communism became identified with the Soviet Union, with repression, with the decimation of society and led to um, this phobia that um, still persists about communism in many parts of, of Europe. So you're saying that communism isn't something that people voted for or actively wished for. It was actually imposed and enforced on the peoples of Eastern Europe. 
Referring back to your previous question, we should bear in mind that the Communist Party, the Communist <coughs> state, especially in Eastern, East, especially in East Central of Europe, because it was never voted into power, required the backing of a secret police. And if you look at the um, the founding charters of the secret police in East Central Europe, you'll see that their role is not to defend the people against political power. It's to defend the communist regime and particularly the single dominating party against the people, so to speak. I mean, to protect the interest of the party, the communist party, um, against any challenges to its power. So these uh, security systems under communism are actually certifying themselves as police states. Um, we can prove that by looking at, as I say, the founding charters. Why was communism not successful in countries like France, for example, but was very successful at the beginning of the 20th century in countries like Russia? I think the, um, the main reason is, of course, Russia descended into a civil war. Um, it was fighting, it was involved in the First World War. Um, the troops in 1917, that is the Russian troops, especially on the Romanian front, were very poorly uh, supplied. Um, they had to enjoy, uh, or suffer rather, they had to suffer a very harsh winter, uh, and they rebelled effectively. They said that they were going to throw down their arms, and this led to a crisis in the Russian government at the time under Kerensky in early 1917, and the, Rus and the Romanians were abandoned, so to speak, by the Russian army. And the Russian army went off and uh, fermented, one might say, was a major instrument in the Russian Revolution, which brings ultimately the Bolsheviks to power. Uh, in Romania, again, we need to bear in mind that the ideology uh, behind communism, Bolshevism, was alien to most Romanians, even the peasantry, who of course wanted reform. But they didn't want it as far as we can tell in the expressions they gave to leftist ideas in Romania. They didn't want it uh, embodied in, in, in a form of repression. And so they became divorced. The Romanian peasantry really uh, divorced themselves, I would say, from the Bolshevik stroke communist ideology. You spent a long time studying communism in Eastern Europe, specifically in Romania which you visited in 1965. In what respects do you think that Romania, communism in Romania differs from communism in other countries? I think this probably goes back to uh, the period before communism in Romania, including the Second World War and the period before that. Do you think the Holocaust played a part the, in, the, in the, it? The Holocaust played a part, but of course the, the fate of the Jews and the suffering of the Jews in Eastern Europe occurred also beyond Romania. It, it, it occurred in uh, Czechoslovakia, or what, what was Czechoslovakia, or remained of Czechoslovakia in World War II. Not much of it remained because it was occupied by pro-German forces. Um, the same is true of, uh, to a certain degree, again, of Bulgaria. We have um, in countries like Hungary a very extreme right regime that, that phenomenon fueled the antagonism of people uh, in the Jewish communities in those countries because clearly the rise and then the exercise of power by anti-Semitic governments in much of Central Europe uh, led to a fear developing amongst the surviving Jews that a similar uh, persecution and death would take place amongst their communities uh, at the tail end of the war. Of course, the many Romanians saw the Red Army as this conquering force that sought to impose Soviet control, and Soviet control meant Stalinism, and it meant socialization, and as I say, the revolutionization of Romanian society uh, in 1945 and afterwards. And that happened, uh, uh, as we know, on the 23rd of August 1944, when Romania switched sides yes. and was liberated 
quote unquote, by the by yes. the Red Russian Red Army. Another very important date uh, in Romanian history is December 1947. This is the date when King Michael uh, was forced to abdicate and. Uh, uh, before the Russians were able to expand communism and uh, install communism in Romania, they had to get rid of King Michael. Yes. Do you think that King Michael made the right decision to abdicate in December 1947? I, I think um, he had no alternative because he was threatened by the Prime Minister Groza at the time with uh, violence in Bucharest if he didn't accept this ultimatum from Broza, which of course was imposed by the Russians. Uh, he was, he was uh, under the threat of causing, not causing directly, but indirectly causing violence within Bucharest. And he saw this as a way of saving lives, his abdication. Um, again, we have to bear in mind that King Michael's very difficult position because he was the last surviving monarch in East Central Europe, and he was effectively abandoned by the West because of the agreements um, arising from Stalin's meeting with Churchill in October 44 and then their validation in inverted commas at Yalta. So Michael saw that the US and Britain were not going to intervene to save the monarchy and in fact in the communization of Romania which had already begun in the spring of 1945 the US and Britain were spectators. They stood on the side why the Russians uh, took the lead in the imposition of communism. So King Michael wasn't helped by, by the Western powers. Um, what about 1990? So after the fall of communism, after Ceausescu was executed, King Michael tried to return to Romania. In, uh, so, some people might, might ask, how is it that Romania didn't go back to being a monarchy? Why was King Michael not allowed to enter Romania when he first tried to do so? Uh, well, because those in power in the, the National Salvation Front were uh, proto-communists, we might say. I mean, they were members, they have been, the vast majority have been members of the Communist Party, and they wanted to take control of the country. And of course, the return of King Michael uh, and the uh, re-establishment of a monarchy would, would threaten their control. There was also the fear amongst many of them that they would be held to account for their part in the um, repression that took place under Ceausescu, especially in the 1980s. And therefore, once again, it was a, a question of survival for we what are described as the second echelon of communism. I mean, neo-communists, uh, we can, I think, justifiably call uh, all the members of the National Salvation well, not all of them, um, but many of the members of the National Salvation Front who assumed power in January 1990. And they simply didn't want uh, King Michael in the country offering an alternative to their control and their power. You mentioned Ceausescu, and of course you wrote a book about Ceausescu and the Securitate. And we know Ceausescu received uh, Nixon, President, American President Nixon, to Romania in 1969, and you were involved uh, as a translator in those events. But we also know that Ceausescu was, I think, the only, correct me if I'm wrong, the only Romanian president to visit Buckingham Palace uh, in, in a state official visit yeah. to the Queen in 1978. Now, was Ceausescu a good communist? Um, that's a question that we, I think, would, would have had to have asked Ceausescu himself. I mean, in his, old, in his own eyes, he was a good communist because he always justified, uh, or nearly always justified, the stance he took within the, the Warsaw Pact and within Comic-Con, the uh, trade organisation. was the first one the first president uh, from a country under the Warsaw Pact to visit uh, uh, Buckingham Palace, wasn't yes, he? Yes, yes. But uh, he justified his own actions to the Russians on the basis of uh, Marxism-Leninism. I mean, that's quite interesting in reply to your question, was he a good communist? In his views, he was. Yes, he was following Marxist-Leninist ideologies and indeed um, he would quote often Marx on the question of Bessarabia. Marx once wrote, or Engels 
once wrote that Bessarabia was Romanian. Uh, and Ceausescu in the 1960s, in the later 1960s, referred to that quote uh, when he was engaged in discussions with Brezhnev. Um, so the fact that Ceausescu was invited not only to Buckingham Palace, but we have to bear in mind three times, three times uh, to state visits to the United States. Not one Romanian president since 1990 has been on a state visit to the United States. Ceausescu managed three of them. Uh, and that says a lot about the role which the United States saw Ceausescu playing as a breach in the wall of communism. He singled out Nixon, in particular saw um, <clears throat> Ceausescu as a good communist, as a good communist, and indeed Vice President Bush, I think it was in 1983, described Ceausescu as a good communist. Um, of course, to many in Romania, I thought, and I was there at the time, and visits thought this was rather ironic um, when Ceausescu was pursuing these policies of austerity and clamping down on any form of resistance to his regime. But um, Romania was seen as a possible, as I say, break in the wall of communism, and therefore he was cultivated by the United States and following the United States, countries like Britain and France and so on. Uh, and he played that card of being anti-Russian very well. I think one has to justify or recognize his success as in the foreign policy sphere um, on the diplomatic front, where, of course, he uh, became uh, a problem for the West was with the uh, growth of uh, interest in ecological matters, of green matters, his policy of systematization in 1988, planning to raise villages in large numbers. And this. From 13,000 to 5,000 yeah, at some point. Yes. And this again coincided with the movement in the West of interest in village life, of the need to protect the um, world against greenhouse gases, of the need to cultivate village life. Here, Ceausescu scored a veritable own goal by playing into the hands of those who were opposing those internal policies or some of the internal policies that were adopted. And I think it's interesting to follow the Western press to see that criticism of Ceausescu really develops in the West after the advocacy of the um, ecological systematization policy is not on the basis of Ceausescu's suppression of human rights, about which various activists in the West have been writing for years. It's the systematization policy in March 1988 that really drives criticism in the West of the Ceausescu regime. Now, country life and the peasantry, as you mentioned, is at the heart of the Romanian uh, identity and people. Why did Ceausescu want to annihilate thousands of villages in Romania? Why, why wasn't it important for him to do this? What he was trying to do, um, um, if you read his pronouncement, was to modernize, in his terms, modernize the village. So when the press talked about annihilation, they were simplifying things. He, he wasn't out to actually destroy physically villages, although in one or two cases he did. He wanted to bring the village into the 20th century, and that meant creating clusters uh, of villages, as in France, where you have villages, but also you have, at the higher level of administration, the cluster of villages. He was attempting to, for example, bring in one police station for seven villages, instead of having one police station in each of those seven villages. He wanted to have cabinete medicale, no medical facilities for clusters of villages, rather than having them in each village. But in doing that, he was going to create a certain amount of unemployment because, of course, the doctors in villages found themselves without employment. Some of them were brought into the clusters. Um, and this meant, if you like, in administrative terms, on paper, the destruction of village life. 
but in his eyes he was looking to improve village life. It's just that it was not done in a democratic nature. There was no discussion of this plan at the local level. There was no discussion of which houses might be demolished in order to, to make way for an enlarged civic centre in each village. And so people found themselves in certain villages without a house and forcibly moved to the outskirts of a village in blocks of flats which were unfinished. I mean, one example I saw myself in the late uh, 80, 80, uh, 1980s was Otopen. People moved from uh, outside Otopen from villages into uncompleted apartment blocks in Otopen. And of course, they had no electricity. Very few of them had access to running water. And this was the indignity and the inhuman side of systematization, which added to the austerity problems that Romania was already experiencing in terms of supplies of food and basic foodstuffs. Remember, Romania, as we all know, is a major agricultural country, and yet it was importing foodstuffs from outside. It was selling its meat to the Soviet Union, uh, and there were shortages of meat. Um, it was a, an energy producing country, so it produced petrol and gas. Um, well, it's clearing the foreign debt. Yes, but it was selling them to clear the foreign debt. And uh, Ceausescu introduced, as we know, this very draconian um, austerity program in which people suffered. I mean, they weren't able to heat their homes properly in the late 1980s. Which, all drove, which drove the resentment against Ceausescu internally and his insensitivity to the problems that people faced. I mean, think of it, um, and I experienced this in the last time I was allowed into Romania before the revolution. In October 1988, I was with a Romanian friend in Bayamare. We were leaving Bayamare and there was a lady standing by the road with two plastic bags full of bread. And she worked in the knitwear factory in Bayamare and she was flagging cars down, hitchhiking. And we stopped to pick her up. And uh, we naturally we asked her, why are you carrying these loaves of bread? And she was taking them to her parents in a village 10 kilometers south of Bayamare because they had no bread. And she said she did this on every Friday two plastic bags full of bread. And I said to her, well, um, this is you know, very noble of you. And of course, um, I, both I and my friend congratulated her and praised her for doing this. But I said, this is a, a real uh, condemnation of communism. It can't even feed its own people. And it's an agricultural breadbasket. You started talking about life in Romania under the communist regime, which is very interesting. And as we know, life in, in the 70s and 80s was very different in Romania than it is now. Uh, and you've experienced this firsthand because you actually went to Romania numerous times, both in the 70s and, eight, and the 80s. And you were actually married. You got married in mm -hmm. Romania in, early, in the early 70s. Now, uh, in your book, In Quest of Romania, uh, you describe a bureaucracy under communist Romania. And you, you tell this story about how your wife tried to get a, a, a passport, a Romanian passport, so she was able to uh, come to London with you. Now, what is your experience of the absurdities of the bureaucracy in communist Romania? Uh, first of all, the authorities, when we uh applied for the passport. This was at the Ministry of Internal Affairs. So this was the passport office of the Ministry of Internal Affairs, which was controlled by the Securitate, effectively. Um, and um, the bureaucracy was such that you had to navigate these uh, various impediments in order to obtain the necessary documentation to, uh, to uh, secure eventually the visa which came with a passport so you, the passport contained your exit visa and uh, I ought to say here that I was helped very much uh, in approaching this problem by uh, academic friends 
um, in the Institute for Southeast European Studies, whom I happen to know because one of them, uh, Professor Virgil Kundia, um, knew that, I'd, that my wife had applied for permission to marry me. And uh, I learned after this episode with the 35 documents from him that he spoke to the secretary of the, of the state council, who was a school friend of his, um, to expedite, to accelerate the procedure. And so in order to get permission to be married in the first place, quite apart from getting the passport, but in order to get uh, permission to marry, we had to have the permission of Ceausescu himself. And the man at the state council actually forwarded our application in a bunch of papers so that they were approved more rapidly than in the subsequent bunch of papers which were due to be lodged five months later. So we didn't have to wait quite so long to get permission to be married because you had to be married by the state. Um, and in our case, Sektor Unu in Bucharest. Uh, after that, you then applied for your passport because you couldn't apply for a passport unless you could show that you were married or my wife could show she was married. So um, that question of uh, getting friends and family to produce each of those 35 documents required the what the Romanians called at the time the Pecere, no, the Partido Comunista Roman. But pile conoscenze si relazzi. That was the key. And uh, that's how we got many of our friends to help us through that bureaucratic maze and get the documents. And, uh, uh, and then she went through this charade of going through a filing cabinet with passports in it. And um, the passports then were arranged according to colour. So you had a blue passport if you were leaving so permanent residence abroad. You had a green passport if you were leaving an interesse servitu. Uh, and you had a brown passport if you were a Saxon leaving for good, leaving Romania. And I could see her rummaging through. And I said to the lady, you're looking in the wrong drawer. You need to look for a blue passport. And she turned to me and she said, uh, in Romanian, Tavaroshul Deletan. And then she said, Pardon, Domnul Deletan. Um, I, I see that you understand the way the Ministry of the Interior works. And she went straight to another filing cabinet and produced the passport. But again, it was an, an indication of how she wanted to exercise a last bit of control over our, our fate. So at the time, Romania was very much a police state, and you mentioned the Securitate earlier. The Securitate was the Romanian secret police that oversaw almost uh, all activities yes. in, in uh, Romanian yes. society. When was the, the Securitate created in Romania, and how did it differ from the KGB or the Stasi? Uh, it was set up uh, in August, uh, 30th of August, 1948, on the model of some of the other um, security services that the Soviets set up. Um, and so or the three directors of the Securitate, General so on, Mazuru, um, uh, General Bodnarenko, and uh, the second one was Nikolsky, they were the three. They all had to be certified by the Soviet NKVD. And in one case, when I was doing my research in the Chenesas, I saw the certification for General Mazuru, it was. Uh, and so these were instruments, clearly, of the Soviet security services, because without the Soviets' go-ahead, say so, um, they couldn't be appointed. And then once they were appointed, the Soviets sent in counsellors not just for the Securitate, but for every ministry in Romania. And in the ministries, you had um, an office of the minister, say the Minister of the Interior had an office, but he had permanently a door open in the adjoining room where the Soviet councillor sat. And often the Soviet councillor was a Bessarabian who knew Romanian, of course. That was the reason why, one of the reasons why the Soviets used Bessarabians. 
um, in the ministries of the interior. Uh, and the Soviet control over Romania was total, not just in the Securitate, of course, but in all the ministries. Uh, so you had the minister who might be Romanian or was Romanian in most cases, but the deputy minister was often a Soviet citizen, often, not always. But even if you were a deputy minister, you still had to have the approval of the Soviet councillor who sat in an adjacent office, always with his door open. So he could hear what was being said by the minister of the interior or the Minister of Agriculture or who it might be. And as I say, this was a blueprint. The blueprint for all of these services was Moscow. They had their script, so to speak, and they supervised the application of the Soviet model in all the security services in Eastern Europe under, under, in the Soviet bloc, in Soviet satellite countries. Not long after the overthrow of Ceausescu, in 1993, you met uh, the director of SRI, the Romanian Intelligence Service, and you were given access to the Securitate files, yes. uh, which was unprecedented. Were you the first academic to see those files, and were you shocked by what you saw there? Um, I can't say for certainty that I was the first um, academic to see the files, because I think um, one Romanian scholar, Mihai, Pelin, who's now passed away, he had seen some of the files. But um, I certainly, as far as I'm aware, the first non-Romanian scholar to see these files in 1993. And I, I won't say I was shocked because I'd already um, heard from friends of my wife's family um, who had suffered under the communist regime. I mean, my father-in-law, he was a political prisoner and, and uh, my wife's grandfather, he'd been arrested and spent, spent five years in Siget. So I, I knew a little about the, from first hand, from how uh, prisoners were treated in Siget and, and how they'd been arrested and what happened to them and some, some indication of how they were interrogated. So I wasn't completely new um, to the documents. Um, I think what... Uh, surprised me was the fact that in several of the, docu of the, of the folders I saw, there is um, a, what they call a fire de, or fire de consultare. You have to sign if you've seen the documents. And the documents that I saw only had, some of them had no signatures whatsoever, but one or two of the volumes had a single signature in them. And uh, they were the signature of the Minister of Engineering, Drigic, Alexander Drigic, uh, who signed the document. And uh, these, were about, these were documents that, um, of course, I felt privileged mm -hmm. to see. And uh, because of that, I asked if I could uh, have them microfilmed. And the cost would, uh, was one dollar just a shot, and I didn't have that sort of money. I was working on, on my own. It was just my personal project. I wasn't funded by anyone. But um, I spent uh, a couple of weeks just copying down uh, a lot of the documents and especially a ledger. You know, there was a, um, oh, oh, carte de contabilitate would be a, an accountant's ledger, a huge blue covered ledger, which had no call mark, you know, no cotta. Uh, but it had the names of the 4,400 officers of the Securitate who were appointed on the 30th of August, 1948. And they were all written in pencil. And uh, I realized, because I spoke to the SRI colonel who advised me, helped me out a little bit when I was going through these files, I said, why are they in pencil? And his reply was, you know the answer to that. Uh, and I said, do you mean they no longer worked? And he said, you could put it that way, yes. 4,000 names, of course, I couldn't, because they're in pencil, I couldn't photocopy them or microfilm them. And so I copied down just the names of the senior officers in each of the 13 territorial directorates of the Securitate, as they were in August 19, 
48 and copied them down. And then some years later, when I wrote the book about Ceausescu and the Securitate and used that information, um, Gheorghe Onishor, who was a good friend of mine who was then director of the Chene Sas archive, um, asked me about the ledger and he said, Dennis, what was the call mark? Where is it? And I said, it didn't have a call mark. And I told him the story I told you. And he said, we can't find it anywhere. And they still can't find it as far as I know. Uh, and that's why I'm able to quote names that other people don't know of, or they may know of them, but they haven't quoted them because I found the names in the ledger. So how did the Securitate grow from a very small force of about 14,000, if I'm not mistaken, you, you mentioned this in, uh, in your book, to a huge force of 450,000 no, in 1989? Um, you have to break down the figures. Now, the 450,000 were informers that were on the books of the Securitate running from 1948. Uh, as far as I recall, Mr. Magorianu said that of that 450,000 from 1948, only 100, around 150,000 were active at the time of the revolution. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, of course, we, we're still finding out today who was uh, a Securitate informer and who, was, who wasn't, uh, because there are still restrictions in place in Romania on uh, who you can access the personal files of former Securitate officers in the first place, and secondly, uh, informers. In my own, the case of my, my own file, I asked for the informers to be identified, and they never have been, although I can work out myself who they were from the context. But although the legislation is in place for you to do that, it doesn't necessarily mean that the law will be applied. So, and this is true of Romania in general, I would say, you can say the laws exist and the law uh, does exist. But in many cases, the supplementary legislation to enforce the law doesn't exist, whereas it does exist in the UK, in the United States, in some of the other Western democracies. But in many cases in Romania, it doesn't exist. So you can have a law, but if the supplementary legislation to apply it doesn't exist, it's useless. You can't appeal to it. And that's still a problem, a wider problem in Romania of what I would call bureaucratic inefficiency or bureaucratic uh, ineptitude. Let me just deviate a lot. Since Romania joined the Uni European Union in 2007, it received cycles of grants from, from Brussels every four years or five years. It has never used the full amount that Brussels has given since 2007 in those cycles. And in the last cycle, which expired last year, I think I'm writing saying, Romania dispersed, so it used barely 60%. These are Brussels figures, not figures I've invented. Brussels figures show that it used very, uh, barely 60% of the monies allocated to Romania in that four or five year period. So what is the reason for that? Do you, do you think it's the Euro Romanian bureaucracy? Yeah, it's Romanian bureaucracy and still today. So the cycle for applying for these regeneration funds today for many of the programs uh, finishes at the, end, at the end of July, at the end of this month. And under many of the programs, so agriculture, transport, infrastructure, law and so on, the Romanian government hasn't forwarded or been able to form a forward from the various ministries the projects for which money has been set aside. But Romania will lose that money. Going back to the Securitate yes, after yes. 1965, um, I just wanted to ask you, do you think there was religious freedom in Romania during communism? Um, no, I mean, broadly speaking, there was no religious freedom unless you were a member of a faith that was certified by the Ministry of Ministerial Kulten or Ministry of Cults, if you like, or Ministry of 
um, <clears throat> confessions is perhaps the best way of translating it. So if you were a member of uh, the Greek Catholic Church, you couldn't worship openly ever since 1948, effectively when the priests of the Greek Catholic Confession were forced to um, adopt, to assume orthodoxy, to join the Orthodox Church. And those who didn't were jailed. Um, so it wasn't just the uh, prelates or bishops of the Greek Catholic Church who were jailed because they all refused, but the priests in many cases um, were jailed for refusing to pass over to orthodoxy. And, and those that, that uh, refused were jailed. They spent, I think some of them spent up to two, two years in jail um, after 1948. And after they, were in, after they were jailed, they actually did pass over to orthodoxy because they wanted to keep their uh, profession and their faith and did so under the aegis of the orthodox church. Um, so there wasn't complete religious freedom. And there were other people that, uh, from other faiths that went to jail. We know about uh, Nikolai Steinhardt or yes. uh, Richard von Brand yes. and um, many yeah. others. Yes. Uh, who, who were jailed, both uh, people from the evangelical uh, sphere or orthodox yes. or, or other yes. faiths. Um, do you know of any other prominent people that uh, were imprisoned? And also, some of them, as we know, were recruited by the Securitate and became informants. Some leaders of the evangelical churches, of the orthodox churches. Yes. How did the Securitate persuade them to become informants? Um, well, first of all, I don't know of many cases, although um, <clears throat> because it's not been a particular subject of my research. I mean, my research is much broader about people who were jailed um, for being dissidents mm -hmm. or so on. But I, I know of other researchers who followed that and, uh, and have traced figures from different confessions, different faiths who've been jailed because of their anti-government statements, anti-regime uh, statements. Um, the Securitate often blackmailed figures into being informers. And uh, we have to bear in mind that, um, unfortunately, in the late 1930s, many Orthodox priests joined the Iron Guard, the were led on out. And the communist authorities used their membership of the Iron Guard to blackmail them into being uh, informers for the Securitate. Uh, there's been a recent uh, controversy in Romania, you may know of this book, about the history of the Orthodox Church, uh, written by uh, an eminent uh, Swiss professor, <clears throat> um, where he mentions the... Schmidt. Schmidt. Oliver N. Schmidt, yes. Schmidt, where he mentions the collusion of many Orthodox priests with the Securitate. Mm -hmm. And this is a reason why, I suspect, um, the Orthodox Church has refused him access to their archive, and not just to Professor Schmidt, but to other mm -hmm. scholars. I, I'm, I've never asked for access to the Orthodox Church archives because I've been focusing on other subjects, but I know of colleagues in Romania who've asked, Romanian scholars who've asked for access, uh, for access and they've been refused. And, and this is a dark spot on the history of the Orthodox Church in Romania. Uh, having said that, there were many Orthodox priests who ja were jailed because they were opponents of the regime. There well, the, what are some of the reasons for which well, they were jailed? They, uh, later in the 70s with the um, systematization, or before systematization, certain priests who protested against the about the demolition of churches, uh, who, who've been um, who've been um, victimized, one might say. Uh, one was the th priest in the United States who who left for the United States. I'm trying to remember now. Shapte Taine, he he has a a book, uh, Shapte Taine, um, and he was accused of being a member of the Iron Guard in his youth. Um, his name escapes me for the moment, but he, the Americans petitioned for him to be released from jail because he'd spoken out against the communist regime in the late 70s and 
uh, early 80s and he went to the United States. So he was a well-known figure, as I say. It's just, um, I can't remember his name. There are other other countries that petitioned for Romanian evangelicals to, yes. to be released. In like Sweden, the, yeah. And we know the case of Richard Wurmbrand, who, who, yes. who visited actually the UK in 1968 yes. and 1972, yeah. got some uh, time on uh, ITV actually when yeah. he spoke about the atrocities. Yes, in God's uh, Underground, his, exactly. his novel, his book, his book of memoirs, in God's uh, Underground, and he attracted large audi- audiences on his tour and his visit to uh, Romania, uh, sorry, to London uh, back in the early 80s. Although he did have... Uh, an exchange with the Archbishop of Canterbury in 1972, who uh-huh. disagreed with him on some of the points that Wurmbrand raised yes. about life in communist Romania. Yeah. And can I ask you, what would the Securitate do to a Romanian priest that was imprisoned for statements against the regime, for instance? What would happen in prison and what would be the, the sentence for them? Well, the Securitate would carry out a sentence imposed by the tribunal, by a court. And the, I have to bear in mind that often in these cases of security, the, the court was made up of three military judges. So we're not talking about civilian judges. We're talking about military judges who obey a command because they're in the military. And in the case of Petrushkanu, for example, back in 19, April 1950. You studied this in the archives. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Uh, April 1954, but going before that, going back to the uh, late 1940s and the trials of people accused of being spies of France or Britain or United States, their trials were conducted by military tribunals, not by civilian tribunals. And we know the orders came down from the Central Committee as to whether X or Y should be found guilty or not. Not quite a fair trial. Not quite, no. Especially as in some cases the defence attorneys were appointed by the Ministry of Internal Affairs. So um, uh, it was as though the poor victim had one, or he and his advocates had one hand tied behind their backs. I mean, they were compromised by the regime from the very outset. But uh, the conditions they endured depended very much on the prison that they were sent to. Some some commandants were less um, harsh than others. Um, some of the conditions uh, were appalling, such as Rumniku Sarat, where people, or, which is a one-story, or was largely one-story prison, and they had a regime of silence there. So the prisoners, even when they were let out, were not allowed to converse with each other. Um, if you were in Siget, um, the priests there, um, so I was told by my mother-in-law because she spoke with her father-in-law who spent five years in Siget. So the Greek Catholic priests who were in their 60s and 70s were made, they were given 30 minutes to exercise each day in the courtyard of the prison. And the, the uh, guardians or the jailers made them vault over. So they had to perform piggyback, you know, peer piggyback. And the priests had to vault over the stooped, other stooped prisoners. And if they didn't vault over the other stooped prisoners, they were whipped. And that's what my, what I learned from my mother-in-law. I didn't hear this firsthand, but this is what she was told by her father-in-law. Because when he was released from prison in the summer of, um, summer of 1955, he would sit in the sun on the balcony of his former flat in Bucharest so that the wounds on his back would heal. And this was a man who was, when he was released, was in his late 60s. And I heard that from my mother-in-law. So that gives you some idea of the conditions that figures like uh, um, Karakostia, his name was Dimitri, a former um, minister in the government in 1940, um, that they endured. I, I, I can't speak to a specific case of a, uh, of a evangelical, for example, being treated in that way, but it gives you some idea of the conditions that uh, prisoners endured in, mm-hmm. in Romania. And I, and I wrote about 
some of those cases in the book about Ceausescu and the Securitate. Many of them suffered torture, as you say. Yes. And many were sent to labor camps to the Danube Canal, yes. the canal that was built, being built yeah. between the Danube River and the Black Sea, or they were sent to Pitesht, another prison. Yes. Uh, and we, we are familiar with the Pitesht phenomenon. phenomenon. Now, there was an experiment at Pitesht uh, prison where the, the torturers, people, the, 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 the people that ran the prison, wanted to re-educate the, the, the inmates yeah. into, the, into communism and convince them using various methods, persuading them using torture and brainwash, they yeah. tried to brainwash them to adopt communist ideas. Did that, how did that experiment run and was it successful? Um, well, it was, we believe um, it's very difficult to find complete documentation about the origins of the Pitesht experiment. But it seems to have been directed by uh, General uh, Nikolsky, Alexander Nikolsky, on the orders of the Russians. Because the Russians, under using a theory of, uh, of a, a figure called Makarenko mm -hmm. on re-education, applied this tactic in Romania, in Pitesht. And the idea was to use former Iron Guardists who'd been in jail in Suchava prison where there were a number to force them again through blackmail to torture prisoners in Pitesht who were known opponents of the communist regime and to torture them into recanting and to becoming either members of the party or at least sympathizers. Uh, and they were directed by a man called Eugen Tsurkanu who uh, and, and word about this experiment in Bitesh got out to Radio Free Europe and Radio Free Europe broadcast news of these, the treatment of these figures, uh, the treatment given to them in Bitesh. And because it was so embarrassing to the communist regime, the Soviets instructed Dej to end the experiment and to find scapegoats. And so Nikolsky, although he was the man principally applying the program, because he was a general of the Securitate, appointed originally by the NKVD, he was excused. He was effectively sidelined. And Suakanu, the former Iron Guardist, some friends of his from Suchava, who had been brought to Pitesht to apply the program, they were tried on the grounds of torturing prisoners, found guilty and shot, all of them. I think there were 13 or 14. But they were the scapegoats, but they were acting under the orders, mm. as far as we can tell, of the Securitate in the person of Nikolsky. What about resistance? What sort of resistance was there from the Romanian civil society against these atrocities, against the Securitate and the communist regime? And you studied the problem of resistance in, uh, in the SRI files in 1993. You, you studied a little bit about uh, the resistance in mountains that you, yeah. you discovered and also resistance through culture. What was that? Um, Romania uh, again, was, I think, a victim of its geographical position because the Western media did not really pay a great deal of attention either to Bulgaria or to Romania because they were too far away from, I'm putting it crudely, Budapest or Vienna. Very few correspondents, Western correspondents, ventured beyond Vienna or Budapest. And so Romania was the other side of the moon, like Bulgaria. And correspondents... The, the dark side. The dark side of the moon, yeah. Um, and the correspondents didn't really delve into the internal problems of Romania, especially repression. A, because they couldn't get here, or at least if they tried to, there were many obstacles placed in their way. But B, because um, I don't think many of them tried. That's my personal opinion, trying to discover reports on Romania in the Western press in the 50s or 60s. Uh, and some of the reports you got were by fellow travellers, you know, pro-communist sympathisers uh, in the Western media. Uh, but others 
just say very little about the regime and the repressive aspect because the Securitate was very efficient. We have to admit that. They were an extremely efficient organization because of the way in which they penetrated Romanian society and blackmailed large parts of, security, of, the, of Romanian society into assisting them. And if you think that if you're in a security service, the more help you can get from the citizen, the ordinary citizen, the less work you have to do. And you can rely on them. Uh, and that's what, going back to Nazi Germany, because I studied Nazi Germany, that's what the Gestapo did. They relied on, they sat in their offices very often, and in their notes they said how good it was that Frau Schmidt reported on her neighbour that she didn't wash her doorstep every Sunday. Those are the reports of the Gestapo. The, the, security, the security services under communism use the same tactics. Many of them let society do their dirty work for them. And I'm afraid that a lot of Romanians were caught up in that web of collaboration for various reasons. What I really like about your book, In Search of Romania, is that you write short portraits of some important figures in communist Romania, some bright figures like Corneliu Coposu, you yeah. talk about Corneliu Coposu and many others. What are some of the most important figures of Romanian resistance? The, uh, the, for me, the most important ones um, that I knew, that I mean, personally, were Doina Cornia and Corneliu Coposu, but also I met in, parting, in passing Radu Filipescu. I mean, I, I didn't know, I, I knew he'd been arrested for distributed leaflets, but I didn't know exactly uh, what he'd done. I, I guessed that he'd put in these leaflets in Dumutabere or somewhere in people's letterboxes denouncing the regime. Uh, I, I think I was driven by um, trying to restore to history figures in Romanian society who deserved to be restored and who've been overlooked mm -hmm. and who hadn't received the praise, the admiration, the merit that they they deserved. And the, and again, when you're looking at Romania and Bulgaria as well, you, you your admiration for these figures grows because you realise the context in which they were working was very difficult. As I said, there weren't very many Western journalists who could take up a Romanian dissident's cause. In fact, with uh, Koposu, as far as I know, no one, no British journalist interviewed him after he came out of jail from, well, Jotdow, he was in Domiciliu Fort Saarbin in Dobroja in 65. Um, I might be wrong there, but I didn't come across any interviews. Uh, and similarly with Doina Cornia, the people who interviewed her were French and Belgian journalists. It, were, uh, it wasn't until late 1988 that I think a British journalist actually interviewed her. Uh, and, and, and so because of that, Romanians who got their news about what was happening internally from Voice of America or BBC or Radio for Europe, they didn't even know themselves what was happening in Romania in terms of dissidents. And that's because, as I say, the Securitate were so good at uh, really isolating these figures of resistance in Romania. The same with resistance, residents and Munz, you know, the resistance in the mountains. No one wrote, or hardly anyone wrote in the rest in the West about General Ars or Colonel, he was, Arsenescu, about Arnett Soyo and his bands in the 50s. Uh, and only um, news began to leak out about their resistance, which lasted more than 10 years in Munsi Karpats. Only after 10 years, people began to talk about these figures. And I remember even with a friend of mine who lived <laughs> locally in, the, in the Kampulung, uh, he knew about Arnott Soyo, and when he spoke to me, this was in the 70s, he always spoke in a whisper about him, even though we're in a village in his home. And uh, again, it's indicative of the, the way in which people became conditioned to talking about any form of resistance. They were afraid to 
speak o- openly because Arsenescu was eventually arrested and then he was shot as a traitor. So there was relatively little resistance in Romania. Very little, yeah. And uh, the resistance that, and the voices that did get to be heard outside were were fairly, uh, uh, were quickly uh, forced by the Securitate to withdraw. And uh, we know that many people lost their jobs um, yes. and uh, Doina Kornia yeah. included, and many others weren't uh, allowed to, to go out or yeah. were, were arrested at home and so on. How did communism shape the social structures in society and in the, lo- the local communities, given that the Securitate managed to get literally half of the country, half of the population spying or turning on onto the other half? Um, I wouldn't be uh, as blunt as that to say that half the country despised spied on the others. And, and in the first place, um, many people informed uh, without giving the engagement, so they didn't they didn't receive any money from the Securitate. And when you read their reports, and this is true of my own file, a lot of the information they gave was completely innocuous. Um, it wasn't damaging to me personally. Which, as you say, was such a lo- loss of uh, resources, such a waste yeah, of time a and waste resources. Of waste of t- uh, and the fact that, um, I mean, I read many of these reports with amusement and also admiration because these were people who were friends of mine and I could see they were under some pressure and they uh, they managed to retain their humanity in their reports so they didn't say anything that was damaging to me, but Can you they think were right to give a report. Uh, sorry? Can you think of an example? Well, um, there was a very good friend of, my, of ours who worked in a computer factory, IT factory, who was constantly being asked what I was doing and what my wife was doing. She was a school friend of my wife. And, and, uh, and uh, in her reports, um, or the reports I saw from this particular person, it was daily things like... Uh, me going or my wife going to the Autosiviere or the magazine Alimentar and not finding eggs or something like that, which was true. You know, you couldn't find an egg or, or um, the price of bread had suddenly risen by Tres Esteban or something like that. Um, and there were others, um, for example, <laughs> one of the uh, Romanian teachers, who, the lectors who came under the culture agreement, and I befriended many of them, and they were required under the terms of their agreements, because I found this after the revolution, to report on whom they met uh, and what they discussed with me. And um, so one, one of the lectors, he was very helpful, we befriended him. Again, he'd passed away some years ago. But he wrote in, the report, in his report, so that on Sunday, he would come and help me paint our house, interior of our house, because we moved into a house in the mid 80s. And he offered his services and he would come and bring bottles of red wine because he could get them cheap from the embassy here. And of course, we didn't drink until we finished the particular room we were painting. And then we would gossip, we would gossip. And he would just write in his reports. We drank several bottles of wine and we talked about the price of things in England or something like that. But it was nothing. There was nothing really... uh, uh, intrusive, I would say, and nothing damaging uh, to me. And I could see, as I say, he was trying to fulfil his obligations, but in a in a humanitarian, if you like, a human way, in a um, constructive and uh, positive way. I'm also curious to understand whether you think that communism um, encouraged people to to develop a certain fear that you never know. Uh, who might be around the corner turning on to you and you, you never know quite what to say to whom for fear not to, to say something that might be uh, classed as, you know, something offensive or potentially dangerous uh, because you said something, a silly joke about uh, Ceausescu, for yes. instance. And I'm curious to, to, to see what your view, view is on this. Do you think that there was a certain amount of fear in, in, uh, in the population, like in, in Romanian communist culture, and mistrust in, in the other? Um, well, th- yes, the answer 
Uh, to your question is definitely yes, there was a certain amount of fear which led people to be very guarded um, in their conversations with you unless unless you knew them very well or unless they were a family friend. And, uh, and, and uh, you could, again, from the reports in my own file, I, I realized that, uh, that none of my friends and none of the family really said things that were damaging to my wife or to our children or to me. They, they behaved in a very um, honorable fashion. Uh, where people were guarded were if you were in a public sphere and um, you were, say, talking to uh, um, a manager of a state farm, which I happened to do through a friend in Transylvania before 1990. And uh, he, um, he was a Saxon, he managed a pig farm, and he invited me to go around the pig farm. And uh, <clears throat> because I, I knew uh, the relative of his who had suggested that I go and talk to him about the pig farm, so he told me a number of jokes and he could see my reaction to them, and uh, uh, which was, I mean, I laughed and it was very favorable. And then he, he told me about the protocol involving a visit of Ceausescu to the pig farm, which was useful. Uh, of course, I didn't, I didn't write about this. Um, I kept it to myself and told my wife, of course, and, and we laughed. But I, um, I could see that he was running a risk by saying this to me. And although he didn't explicitly say, don't tell anyone else, I knew from uh, the um, nature of our conversation, the context, that I should be discreet about it. And I was. And I, I, I could tell he was taking a risk because I didn't know him that well. But he was taking a risk about telling me about the protocol because he wanted me to know. Um, that this was what was happening under the surface. The more, we might say, discreet information I was given was given very much in, in a context we, in which both of us, both me and the person I was talking to, had a great deal of trust. And sometimes it wasn't. <laughs> With Koposo, um I knew, he told me there were microphones in his apartment, but that didn't prevent us from criticising the regime because... Um, Kaposu said to me, well, if you're not worried about being searched or questioned or something, I'm not worried. And I said, well, Mr. Kaposu, you're running the greater risk. You're running the risk of seeing me. And if you're not worried, nor am I, you know, I'll run the risk. So you had conversations with Kaposu criticizing the regime, yeah, yes. knowing that uh, there were microphones in the room, yeah, yeah, because, and knowing that you might be listened to. Yeah, yeah. Well, we knew. Well, first of all, Kompasu warned me that a particular colonel would come round every time, uh, every time his friends came round, because the Securitate thought Kompasu was planning a revival of the National Peasant Party. And, of course, the only people still alive were in their 70s or 80s, because all the others, poor people, had died in jail, or many of them had died naturally, those that survived jail. But also, um, uh, it was Kaposu who war warned me that I would be searched when I left Romania a few days later. This was in August 1986. Indeed, I was. Uh, but I hid the papers he'd given me to transmit back home in London because he wanted certain things to be known. And I, of course, the British were interested to see whether there was any opposition in an organized fashion to the Ceausescu regime. And there wasn't, from what I could tell. Um, Koposu was interested. He brought his friends together from the National Peasant Party every Friday evening or something to play cards. That was their, and they discussed politics, but the discussions were, were really um, very superficial. I mean, there was no way that they were going to foment the revolt against the communist Regime, they didn't have the means to do that, but but uh, we talked. We didn't talk about fermenting resistance to the regime, but we talked talked about austerity and the restrictions on the National Peasant Party. The fact that um, he had difficulty meeting his friends, we talked about them, and they are recorded in the Securitate's report because they reported on 
So they took a transcript of our conversation from the micro from the microphones, and the report appears not in my file, it appears in Koposu's file. And that's how I learned about it, reading his file. What were the notes? Well, they they were just reports. They they were notes typed up. Mm -hmm. uh, so the report of Colonel So and so on conversation between uh, Cornelio Coposu and Dennis Delitan. So many were innocuous conversations, and these innocuous conversations didn't have any consequences whatsoever. No. Even if they were no. somewhat critical yeah. of, of Ceausescu. Well, well the, 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 yeah, they, they had no consequences because the Securitate knew I was a opponent mm. of the regime, mm -hmm. and, and of course they knew Coposu was. And, they, and then you were a, a declared a persona non grata yeah, in 1988. Yeah, that was later, that was a bit later. later because, I, because of the article in the Times. Yeah, in the Times, yeah, yeah, because I... Um, had written about my experience, one of which was with a lady carrying mm. the bread outside uh, Bayamare. <laughs> and you, you talk in your book that uh, your room was searched uh, in, in the, I think, early 70s. That was, yeah, in the, as well, well, in the late 60s late when 60s. I was a postgraduate. W what did they find? And well, what, they found, what did they confiscate? They, the, the only thing I ever lost uh, was my New Testament in Romanian that was published by the British and Foreign Bible Society. Why, why was that considered I don't offensive? Know. Uh, and it was just a single copy, and that was the only thing that disappeared from my room. Dragi tovares și preti, cetățeni ai capitalii României socialiste, doresc în primul rând să vă adresez dumneavoastră, participanților la această mare adunare populară, tuturor locuitorilor municipiului București, un salut călduros, revoluționar, împreună cu cele mai bune urări de succes în toate domeniile de activitate. Doresc de asemenea să adresez mulțumiri inițiatorilor și organizatorilor acestei mare manifestări populare din București, considerând aceasta ca o... As we close, let's talk about 1989 and the Romanian Revolution. In 1989, Ceausescu, as we know, gave a speech. And during that famous speech that was televised, it was live on, on Romanian national TV, some of it at least. During that speech, there was some, uh, some noise in the crowd. And it looks like the crowd was spontaneously booing him. Is that something that actually happened? Was, was the revolution, do you think, a spontaneous Romanian movement, or was it influenced by outside external powers as well? Um, well, first of all, I wasn't in the square, so I was watching what was happening in the BBC and uh, <clears throat> as an assistant to John Simpson, the world affairs correspondent. Um, so I saw what had happened in the square only to the extent that which Romanian TV covered it because they broke their coverage. And it was only after, in January 1990 when I got to Bucharest and we interviewed, that is one of the BBC teams, the one led by John, 
uh, we interviewed several people who were in the square at the time and we got different um, reports. So uh, what we were told, so one of the reports we were told were that people had come to the square towards the back, especially young people with these banners saying um, Toriasco Parti Pechere or Toriasco Parti do Comunici and Fronte cu Nicolae Ceausescu and so on and so forth. And that um, there had been a stampede in the crowd, whether purposeful or not, we don't know. But because of the stampede in the crowd, these, um, these banners and the wooden poles they were on were trampled under and they caused the noise and the crack and the shouts which were recorded on Romanian radio, not so much on Romanian TV. Which resembled gunshots. Uh, which resembled gunpoint, yes. But uh, that's all I, what I can say from talking to Martor Ocolat, you know, who were eyewitnesses, several of them, in different parts of the square. But I can't say that is the truth. I mm. wasn't there. Mm. I'm just giving you the various... I died um, a distillation of some of the views I got. And that seems to me very understandable that also the stampede was caused or it produced um, waves of people rushing to distance themselves from the stampede for fear that they might be accused of being part of an anti Ceausescu demonstration by the Securitate. So it mushroomed. But it started with, as I say, the collapse of these banners itself, whether that was deliberate or not, an accident, I don't know. But the, the sound of gunshots was the cracking of wood, so it's believed. Uh, and the fact that people booing, that was the production of people in fear, rushing to get away from the stampede that had been created by the fall of the banners. As we know, many people died during those uh, days of warm yes. December, late December. Why didn't Romania have a velvet revolution? Why did so many people die in Romania in those days? Um, because uh, so many people died because the security forces in Romania, and include, I include, including this, the army, were so poorly trained. They weren't trained in power control. They didn't know how to use fire engines to disturb to displace crowds with water. Their method of training was to shoot people. And to shoot people, this is the Garda Patriotica, although the Garda Patriotica couldn't shoot many people because they didn't have ammunition. The army shot people. Uh, we know that from various sources, although the army today disputes this. But we have them on film. Um, the BBC does. Uh, also, members of the Securitate, probably Usla, Probably, I say probably because, again, it's difficult to know because they were dressed mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. particular salopese, you know, they had their particular outfits, fatigues, as we call them. Um, they shot people. And also, when you look at the response of the Romanian army on the 22nd of December, firing into those balconies of uh, flats which the balcony of those flats, that block which is opposite, the block of flats opposite the Central Committee, many of those flats were occupied by Securitate personnel. And we, when I was with the BBC, we discovered their ID cards in those flats, special ID cards. We saw them, we filmed them. And so the Securitate, or an element in the Securitate, I don't want to condemn them all because I'm sure they weren't all involved, but some elements in it were trying to produce, I'm sure, a counter-revolution. Uh, and they were the ones who lobbied, uh, lobbed um, shells onto the top of the Biblioteca Centrale Universitaria, the Central University Library. Uh, and also, they wanted to show, because in the building next to the Beceu was the headquarters of the Fifth Directorate of the Securitate, Ceausescu's personal bodyguard, and the USLA wanted to show, or elements in USLA, wanted to show that there was an attempt of uh, destroying those people who were protected, who were protecting Ceausescu by destroying 
the headquarters of departmental change, you know, directly how ginger it was. So it, it's a convoluted story and it's very difficult to get credible proof of the things I'm telling you. I'm just relating my own experience and what I gathered uh, with the BBC and because we went around trying to discover, well, who fired? Who were these terrorists? Uh, and I'm sure from my own personal observation and those of the BBC team that some of them were USLA people. They were firing. But also many of the victims of the revolution were shot by the army uh, because they, they weren't trained how to deal with crowd control. If you have people demonstrating, you don't stand behind them firing at your opponent, adversary, which is what the Romanian recruits did. And of course, in the return fire, the people standing in front of them, civilians, were killed. But that's basic military training. But the Romanians had no basic military training under Ceausescu. They were short of ammunition. The recruits were peasants from the countryside. They weren't properly trained in security. Um, the Romanian army uh, had its elite elements, but they weren't used to protect the people against the state. This brings me back to my point about communist oppression. That oppression is used by communism to protect communism against the people, not the other way around, which is what we like to think <laughs> is the role of the security service in Western democracies. Uh, and, and that's where this, in my view, ridiculous charge of denying Iliescu the certificate of being a revolutionary. It's ridiculous for me. Uh, I mean, that man sacrificed his life. I'm not discounting, what, I'm not overlooking what he did in the miners, in, with the miners. Yes, that was something that needs to be investigated. But what he did in December was very courageous. And, and uh, in, in, even in January, I was shot at. And I, I'm just thinking of these figures in the FSNA uh, around Iliescu, um, who lived in fear. I'm sure they lived in fear. It wasn't a pleasant place to be in in Bucharest. Um, uh, and I have a lot of sympathy for them. I think um, the, the military prosecutor's office really needs to investigate more closely what happened in the revolution rather than just accepting this blanket view that there were terrorists without identifying who the terrorists were. And there hasn't been really a forensic investigation into who the terrorists were in the revolution. There have been several reports, uh, the one that you referred to, and yeah. of course the SRI report that you talk about in, in the book, but you, you don't think that they're, they're conclusive well, and comprehensive. I, I think the SRI report is partly in conclusive in the sense that mm -hmm. it discounts mm -hmm. any Russian involvement. Okay. I, I don't think the Russians were involved in the displacement of Ceausescu. Ceausescu, they didn't need to be involved because the Romanians did it themselves. They didn't need any help from outside. And the, the very confusion that <laughs> reigned after 22nd of December is proof of that. I mean, if the Russians had been involved, um, they would have proceeded in a rather different manner in toppling the Ceausescu regime. In the first place, they would have used their Spetsnaz troops, you know, and uh, they wouldn't be firing over the heads of civilians into the crowd. Although it has to be said that during uh, the problem, the crisis with Yeltsin and so on, Gorbachev, they did do that, but, um, but not to the degree in which we find Romanian army recruits uh, doing it. And as I say, I think they're accountable for many of the deaths in the revolution. Going back to Ceausescu's last days, after the infamous speech, Ceausescu was uh, collected, was picked up by helicopter, and then the helicopter landed uh, on the motorway. And then following that, he had a, a trial, uh, and then he was executed. Yes. Why did the helicopter land on the motorway? And how, what was his trial like? Um, well, as far as I can tell, so I, when I was doing these follow-up interviews with the BBC, I think I wrote about it in one of the books, 
But um, I interviewed the pilot, uh, Malutian he was, uh, and he told me that he received an order from General Roos, who was head of the Romanian Air Force, that had been given to General Roos by General Stinkalescu after, uh, after the helicopter had been called from Boten or wherever it was. I'm trying to remember. No, it, it landed in um, Snagov and picked up the Ceausescu's with, with uh, the two bodyguards. And then the pilot received an order from General Roos, and General Roos had received this order from St. Kalescu that the, that the helicopter should put down as close as it could to the street, to the main road to Tagovishte, because the St. and those above him, so Brukan, uh, Militaru especially, and uh, Iliescu and Petri Roman, they were worried about Ceausescu getting to Oltenia mm. uh, because they knew from the escape plans that the Ceausescu regime had that he would go towards Oltenia to uh, create a nucleus of resistance to any body that tried to overthrow Ceausescu and proceed from there. So that's the reason uh, that Stankulescu, I believe at any rate, gave this order to Roos, and Roos transmitted the order to Malutsanu, who simply landed the helicopter. And then I wrote about it because I then interviewed the two chauffeurs, two drivers who picked up the Ceausescu because it was on the, the side, they were on the roadside uh, from where the village was, I can't remember. But um, they picked up the, the Ceausescu's and, and... One of them ran out of gas. Yeah, they? well, that's right, one of them ran out of gas. And so they had to flag down a second car who was, wait a minute, the first driver was Nikolai Petushaw and the second driver was a Dr. Decker, mm -hmm. I remember. And Decker was flagged down because Petrushaw had run out of petrol. And he drove them to this station, agricultural station, just close to Togovishne. And then again, it's not quite clear what happened. I mean, it seems that the administrators of the uh, agriculture station caused, called the police in Togovishne mm -hmm. and they sent the car and they took the Ceausescu's to, to uh, the barracks in Togovish Day, where he was kept until the trial. Was that a mock trial? Yes, I mean, it was a kangaroo court. I mean, it was a farce. And there was no uh, really credible evidence that Ceausescu was responsible for the 60,000 victims. I mean, we know there weren't 60,000 victims and uh, that he was accused of genocide. Well, uh, he, wa he wasn't responsible for the genocide. What he was responsible for, and I mean, that's, this is my personal view, was giving the orders that in Timisoara mm -hmm. beforehand, the army again, the army, not the Securitate, the army fired below the knees mm -hmm. on the demonstrators. And uh, Ceausescu had sanctioned that. So that order was given by Stankalescu and Kitsak when they were in um, <clears throat> Timisoara, and that's the degree to which Ceausescu has a culpability in terms of victims of the revolution, um, that he was responsible for these very insensitive policies of his, for which he could be tried, certainly, but not given the death penalty, um, uh, is true. But um, the trial itself was a mockery of judicial practice. Thierry Walton talks about fascism and communism as two main plagues in, in uh, Europe and also in, in Russia. Why is it that in our contemporary culture, most of us are happy to condemn fascism and are very quickly to condemn anything that Hitler did, for example, but we're not so quick to condemn what communism did across Europe? Why, why is that the case? Um, I think it's it's partly to do ac uh, to do with access to archives because the role of the Communist Party in these various countries and in the Soviet Union. If you think today, we still don't have access to the KGB archives. Um, so trying to under uh, to uncover the crimes of communism is very very difficult. 
Uh, when we're dealing with fascism, we're dealing with fascism largely in Western countries, which were liberated by democratic regimes and which led to disclosure of the crimes committed under fascism. Um, we still don't know a great deal about the judicial process in the Soviet Union. Yes, some scholars have written, but in academic journals, and all credit to those authors who tried to um, underline, to focus on the evils of communism and the respective, respective assets. But it's because that visual aspect, you know, we don't have the photographs uh, of the labor camps in Russia, um, that the torture that the NKVD and then the KGB carried out. Well, we have the results, the visual results of the Holocaust. Uh, and of course, visuality, the visual record is far more powerful than the written record. And when we see what was named, done in the name of an ideology, and the problem is that the ideology of fascism very often has examples of encouragement to murder, to the murder of a whole class. Whereas the Soviet Union, we can say, yes, in some respects, communism has that. And indeed, Lenin, we know in some of his uh, writings, talk about, he talks about the annihilation or eradication of the middle class. Yes, but not on the basis of race. It's a class issue. Um, but again, I come back to my point about the visuality, the visual component of seeing what ideological terror can bring uh, when we look at an analysis of the past. Dennis, thank you very much for your time. It's been thank a pleasure you. talking yeah. to you.